Hello class. Um, hello class. We're in part three of this. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of invasive species, like I said in part end of part two. Um, I'm going to shift to the document that you have, and then we're going to go from there. Okay. Um, how does this close and show? Uh, yes. Keep annotations. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> Um, so one of the species that we're going to talk about is the barred owl. Um, the barred owl usually was in the Great Plains. One of the things that happened with the Great Plains was um, heavy hunting of the bison and the deer. People started hunting the bison and deer for food. So you have, once the bison and uh, deer were gone, you have an increase in the um, tree population. And so the trees spread across the Great Plains almost all the way to, uh, to all the way west to California and all the way north to um, Canada. So obviously the spotted, um, the barred owl increased. So just because you have a lot of trees doesn't mean you're actually protecting the environment. It depends on where those trees should be. Um, so the barred owl is way more aggressive than the local spotted owl. So guess what? The spotted owl ran out of food, and the barred owl actually does attack and kill the spotted owl. So not only did the spotted owl lose its food, um, its basic hunting grounds, because now it has a stronger predator in its mix, it also got killed. Um, it does form the sparred owl or the blotted owl as a hybrid species, but the hybrid species is so weak and almost in uh, has a very low viability it is not sterile it's just a weak very inviable has a low viability kind of an organism so genetically they were basically inconsequential now um in 2005 april of 2005 the white house officially announced that the u.s wildlife and fish would give out $700 to anyone who shot and killed a barred owl. Now, I know this sounds interesting because, but idiots. Now, here's what happened. Um, when you play a game of telephone, that is one person. So while they put in a lot of money to kill these animals and to kind of, not, not on the Great Plains, but in California and Canada and all of these places, they don't have, they put in money to give $700 for anyone who killed a barred owl and bought it in. So if you were a hunter, if you wanted that $700, you went out and you killed a barred owl or what you thought was a barred owl and then you bought it in. They did a couple of genetic testing on it, which basically means they looked at it. Um, and then they gave you the $700. The first few pe people did get that $700. However, then word of mouth spreads and people are asked to kill these owls. Um, during that period, there was a 700, uh, 700 to 1,000% increase in killing of raptors. Raptors, the class of raptors, meaning all birds of prey, which is just not a good idea. Um, so not only did we make the situation not only did we cause the situation, we actually made the situation worse by incentivizing killing these animals and not providing the proper education required for people to know exactly what animal they were killing. So we actually went ahead and took out the competition. Um, remember, owls are more nocturnal, so it's a little more difficult to kill owls than it is to kill an eagle um, or, or a vulture or... A regular owl or the owl in your backyard that you grew up with you know so we kill less barred owls oops so um i don't know there's like a weird glitch and it's stopped in the middle uh so we did kill a less uh barred owls and we killed a lot of other owls and other predators so hence we henceforth because idiots um I don't know. That's the best way to encapsulate what we did. Um, there's a lot of, like, when it comes to invasive species, um, there is a lot of short-term planning. 
um, and very short-sighted ideas that are flowed without really understanding the greater implication of all of these organisms on the environment. Instead, it's like, um, let's kill it, let's burn it, let's get rid of it. But, you know, eventually these organisms also become a part of the environment. And they do have a, a considerably devastating effect by just taking them out. Uh, the next one is the Eurasian milfoil, which was originated, you must know these names, um, which was originated in Europe and, and Asia. Again, these are things that grow in water. They're kind of weed looking things that grow in water. They look like the really skinny um, stalks and very, like, almost pine like me, um, the leaves they have. And they form like these really dense mats so it increases the um, oxygen consumption, kind of cuts off the oxygen consumption to the organisms in the bottom of the lake, so killing off a lot of organisms. They also have form huge problem with and very expensive problem because they start clogging the drain, uh, the irrigation lines, water going into the irrigation. So a ton of money has to be spent into cleaning them out. They they, they kind of have two stages they have a gametophyte stage and a sporophyte stage um so the sporophyte the end stage of it the haploid stage of it is really microscopic um they tend to cling to boat uh, the sides of boats and then they can be transferred from one leg to the other very very easily one of the easiest ways to stop any kind of especially in terms of plants in the water uh, migrating from one leg to the other is to have an inspection and to stop um, and you know have a cleaning process for these things. People don't usually clean them. They just like you know, take some water, spray it down. If there if there's anything visible, they spray it down. Otherwise, they don't because boats. A lot of plants that have crossed lakes and have or that have become invasive species from one lake to one river, from a river to another lake, and you know from ocean to ocean has been because of man-made boats. They cling to the side of the boats. You take your boat within 21 days. If you put your boat in any other um, um, conducive environment, now you've given them a new place to live. Um, this is a huge problem. Um, they do clog up the turbines for power generation. Nobody wants that. Um, now we've talked, like, I think in class I told you guys to look it up, the kudzu, which is like this, perennial wine, really sweet smelling, um, it pretty much will take over anything within the shortest period of time. They have an amazing growth rate, which is a foot per day. So the, um, you know, good mature wines are about a hundred feet tall. I mean, you've seen those creepy haunt, haunting pictures of like these old cars in weird neighborhoods where the wines have all taken over that's this one it it is a very very fast growing plant so it kind of replaces the natural flora and fauna which is really bad but it is actually really good when it comes to soil conservation so if you take something like a place that is going through a dust bowl scenario this may not be a bad um, idea on a short period of time where you can just grow it and you can like, you know, keep the soil down and all of that stuff, but then you have to keep the land without growing also. Then you have the ash borer, which is the emerald ash borer, huge problem in the Connecticut area. It kind of bores um, holes into the ash tree and uh, kills it. Now this is another plant, that, that another beetle that also has very 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 tiny seeds so when you go hiking on uh, to a particular place you're actually within your jackets and your your clothing hair i mean even in your hair you actually transport the little embryos of these birds uh, of these um beetles to other places your dogs in the you know in, in the fur of your dogs they have the little embryos so if you go hiking in let's say i don't know where the woods out here or if you go hiking in stanford and they are and the tree ash trees there are heavily infected and then within a week or so they are capable of living on your clothes for almost a week uh week to two weeks so the next week the next two weeks you go hiking in uh let's say in um 
I don't know, like in Maine. So you would have actually carried the ash beetle, um, the ash borer from Stanford to Maine. Now, one of the uh, one of the ways most of our plants were saved was because these guys go really dormant uh, when it's winter. Um, so the longer winters you have, the longer chance the plant has to adapt to these things and find its own way of killing them. However, yay, short winters. Uh, one of the ways they have been working on killing these is actually soaking the plant in uh, pesticide. That has a long-term effect because it does kill plants. It does kill all, and the pesticides that they use are not discriminatory, so they kill everything. Uh, the big carp, uh, big head carp, now in um, New Haven, there is Mia that actually serves the big head carp. Very oily fish. Uh, one of the reasons they, they came from Russia and China, one of the reasons they started using this was these guys are bottom feeders. So if you had an aquaculture pond, you would have one or two car, big head carp feeders and they would actually go ahead and clean the bottom of your lake. Um, aqua, um, aquaculture ponds are artificial ponds. So they have like a cement base to the bottom. So if you have like zoo uh, plankton, phytoplankton, any of these things growing in the bottom, which is basically scum and slime mold and all of that stuff, these guys would eat it all up. So you're like really saving money in terms of um, cleaning up your pond and making sure everything is, you know, clean for the, the Chilean sea bass that you're growing in your backyard. Um, not in your backyard, but you know what I mean. So one of the things, unfortunately, places where you have aquaculture usually are places where there is a lot of water, river water. Uh, one of the ways these basins are usually filled is because when the river overflows, it flows into these basins. That means you have aquaculture in places where there can be a lot of flood. So if you have a place where there is a lot of flood, it's a great place for aquaculture, but it's also once you introduce an invasive species into your aquaculture pond and there is a flood, you have no means of keeping your fish in that pond. So once some of them um, actually escaped into the Mississippi River, now they're everywhere. Um, they do have contests for this, which is fish bow hunters because they're really large organisms. Um, so when you're writing your essays, make sure that you mention at least one of these things. Do not write an essay with just talking about the implications, you know, talk about specific implications. A uh, couple of things that are a huge problem, uh, this is invasive species um, in Connecticut. Now, the top four species that we talked about, they're more general species, they're all over the place. These, this is these three species that we're talking about are to do with Connecticut. Um, I, I don't know, like what time is it? Okay. Uh, the first one is zebra mussels. I think uh, some of you have seen pictures of it. They are voracious filter feeders and they tend to outcompete. They're little mussels. They came from Southeast Asia. They accidentally came in actually shipping containers and in boats. Um, so the, the trade route are a big, big, big problem for introduction of um, invasive species. It's, it's, it's Most of these species were not introduced intentionally. Some of them were, for example, the type of grass in your um, front yard, that was intentionally uh, introduced because it looks better. Uh, but most of the other species was kind of an accident. Um, so, these guys came from the Caspian Sea in uh, Asia. They were accidentally introduced. Again, um, they are, when they are in the larvae stage, they kind of, you know, how everybody knows how mussels grows, right? So these guys take up habitat inside um, pipelines, inside boat hulls. So there's a huge economic implication to these, um, the, these mussels. Um, Okay, I think they are also very fast growing. Again, once they since they're very fast growing, they kind of um, reduce the availability of food for every other organism, like the local organisms. They also don't have a lot of predators. Again, these are guys when they are in their larvae stage can travel in a boat 
from in, in your boat from lake A to lake B to lake C, from river A to river B to river C. They really do love pipelines. They kind of line the inside of pipelines and clog them completely. So that's a huge expenditure for um, agriculture as well as power generation. Um, and I'm going to start the next one um, because...